Welcome back for another Sheriff of Sodium video. Today I'm going to start something new. Uh, my idea here is that, you know, every now and then I come across a journal article that resonates with me. Maybe it shows something completely new, or it studies something important in a different or more authoritative way, or maybe it just confirms my priors and I decide I want to talk about it for five minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to highlight some of these papers in an irregular feature on this channel that I'm going to call the Sheriff of Sodium Journal Club. But don't you worry, this is not going to be some stodgy, egghead journal club. I'm not going to bore you with a monotone recitation of the paper or give you some esoteric breakdown of the methods. This is not going to be your program director's journal club. It's my journal club, and I'm going to try to keep it brief, and I'm going to tell you the things that you ought to know, maybe highlight a paper that you ought to read, or maybe I'll just use someone else's work as a jumping off point to get onto one of my personal soapboxes. Point is, it's going to be a good time, and um, I'm glad that you're joining me for this first one. And for this inaugural edition of the Sheriff of Sodium Journal Club, I'm going to highlight this paper, which recently came out online ahead of print in the journal of the American College of Radiology. It's called An Elite Privilege. Top-ranked medical schools provide fewer comparative performance data on their students. Um, the lead author on this paper is Dr. Charles Maxfield, who's a professor of radiology at Duke University. And um, if you're not familiar with that name, he and his colleagues have written a few interesting papers on medical education and residency selection. So if you're looking for someone to follow on Google Scholar, um, his group's work is consistently interesting. For instance, back in 2019, they did this um, experiment on bias in radiology resident selection in which they manufactured over 5,000 fake residency applications complete with fake USMLE scores and fake class rank. And they also included um, these stock photo headshots of these fake applicants. But then they gave these, these whole fake applications to real radiology faculty members, and they asked them who they would invite to interview. And when they did this, they were able to show that, um, all other things being equal, having an application photo that was more attractive was more likely to result in an interview offer. And it wasn't a subtle effect either. Um, having a photo that was facially attractive was equivalent to a 10-point higher score on USMLE Step 1. Um, if you're interested in that paper, I'll link to it in the show notes, but, um, but more to the point today, in this paper, Dr. Maxfield's group decided to look at the Medical School Performance Evaluation, or the MSPE. It's what we used to call the Dean's Letter, and it's this big document that's intended to provide a comprehensive assessment of a student's performance in medical school. The audience for the MSPE is residency program directors, and they use it to decide which applicants to interview. And make no mistake, the MSPE matters. This graphic here comes from the 2021 NRMP Program Director Survey. And it shows different factors that program directors consider when deciding whom to interview. And there at the top of the screen, you will see that coming in second is the MSPE with 85.9% of program directors saying that they use that to, um, to decide whom to interview. The only metric that got used more frequently than the MSPE were the Step 1 scores. And of course, this is from 2021, um, back before Step 1 scores um, switched to pass-fail. The NRMP also asked program directors about the importance of each metric. Not do you use it or not, but how important is it when you decide on whom to interview? And as you can see here, the MSPE is among the most impactful measures in the whole application. It got a mean importance score of four on a scale of one to five, and that puts it higher than step one scores, step two CK scores, grades and core clerkships, class rank, awards and honors, and almost every single other thing in the application except for a failed attempt at USMLE or Comlex or your medical school losing its accreditation. The point is that the MSPE matters, but each school's MSPE looks a little different. Lots of people have worked to try to make the MSPE look a little bit less different. Back in 2017, the AMC issued these new recommendations to try to standardize the MSPE. Um, and these recommendations are pretty comprehensive. They specify what sections should be included, what font and spacing should be used, how many noteworthy characteristics can be highlighted, and how schools ought to include a key if they use these coded adjectives at the end, like superior or most outstanding or something, to summarize their students' performance. But, um, you know, the AMC is not a police agency, and they can't compel schools to use their format or include data of one type or another. And so, ultimately, schools do what they choose. So, 
What Dr. Maxfield and his group decided to do was examine the MSPEs from different medical schools and see how often um, they included any quantitative or meaningful performance data on their students. So they looked at all the applicants who applied to Duke's Diagnostic Radiology Program for the 2021-2022 application season. And back then they had over a thousand applicants, which gave the authors MSPEs from 95% of all the MD granting schools in the United States and 73% of all the DO granting schools. So they got pretty much all the MSPEs to look at. And then they took all those MSPEs and they examined them to see how data were reported regarding student performance. For preclinical courses, did the schools give just pass fail or did they give letter grades? Um, what about clerkships? And then at the end of the MSPE, did it report a final class rank or give some kind of categorized summative adjective or a quartile or something like that or not? Well, here's what they found. When they looked at preclinical courses, 57% of schools just reported student performance as pass fail. The rest reported student performance in some greater detail, whether that was with an absolute number or some kind of tiered system like ABCD or honors, high pass, pass, whatever. But here's what's interesting, because when they looked at medical school prestige as measured by the school's US News and World Report ranking, the more prestigious schools were more likely to report preclinical performance as pass fail. In this graphic, this figure one from the paper, the green bars show schools that reported number grades and the blue bars show some kind of tiered grading. Um, if you just use pass fail, there's, there's no bar on this graphic. And so as you can see, there were zero schools in the US News and World Report top 10 that used either a number grade or a tiered system. They're all pass fail. If you move out to the top 50, only seven schools used a tiered grading system and only one reported number grades. In fact, the majority of schools that reported numerical grades were at the very bottom of the US News and World Report rankings in that unranked category. Next, they looked at clerkship grading. And here, almost all schools used some kind of tiered system, either grades or honors, high pass, pass, or something like that. 92% of schools overall use some kind of tiered system. But among schools in the top 10 of US News and World Report, only 70% did. In the top 50, only 90% did. Last, they went to the end of the MSPE and they looked to see if there was some measure of overall summative performance. And there they found that some schools gave a numerical class rank. Um, those are the green bars on this figure. And there were more schools that gave a balanced tier grouping. So that would be something like breaking students into quartiles or quintiles. And there were some schools who broke students into groups that weren't necessarily of equal size by designating a certain number of students as superior and some other as outstanding or something like that. And those are the blue bars. And again, we see that same pattern. None of the top 10 schools provided any of this information. And only around half the schools in the top 50 provided an overall assessment of performance into a tiered group. And none of them actually gave a, 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 an absolute class rank. Again, the schools that were most likely to report a numeric class rank were the least prestigious schools, the ones who don't even get ranked in US News and World Report. So what do the authors want you to know? Well, they summarize the findings and I quote, the majority of US medical schools report preclinical class performance only as pass fail. Those schools that do provide multi-tiered preclinical grades are more likely to be lower ranked schools. Conversely, most medical schools do provide multi-tiered grading for the core clinical clerkships, but here too, lower ranked schools are more likely to report grades than our high ranked schooled schools. The most striking disparity in reporting is that of the school-wide comparative summative assessment or class rank. Overall, 70% of medical schools provide summative assessments, but that includes fewer than half of the schools rated in the top 50 and none of the top 10 schools. So what is happening here is, is actually pretty clear, but why it's happening may be a little bit less clear um, unless you put yourself in the shoes of school officials, um, the folks who write the MSPE. Because whether or not you decide to include comparative data, it, it really represents a matter of strategy. If you're a dean at a prestigious medical school, you know your top students are gonna be okay. They don't really benefit from you highlighting them as being your top students to program directors because they're already getting interviewed at the most competitive programs in the country. And in fact, 
If you choose to highlight your best students, well, that, that also means that in some way you have to highlight your worst, and doing that probably diminishes their prospects in residency selection. So why would you do that? I mean, why would you hurt the bottom quartile of your students when doing so doesn't even help your top quartile? And these schools, of course, they realize that, and that's why they don't report this information. Of course, the calculus gets reversed if your school is not a famous school. So if you're a dean there, you know that your highest performing students still probably aren't going to get a look at the most competitive programs unless you show the world, unless you highlight to everyone that these are your best students. So providing a class rank or a descriptive adjective or numeric grades, it may improve the odds of your top students getting a look at the most competitive programs. And it probably doesn't diminish the prospects for your lower performers all that much because by and large they were headed for specialties or programs that aren't so competitive. And so for these schools, many of them, it becomes a trade-off that's worth making. And so the net result that we see is the end result of all these individual strategic decisions that are made in the dean's offices of all the medical schools in the United States. And here I want to be clear, this is a, a, a very good paper and the discussion is um, very fair and balanced, but I think it still becomes clear that the authors believe that this is a bad thing. And several times they point out how um, this system that we've got, it, it may disadvantage high achieving students from lower ranked medical schools. And um, obviously I see where they're coming from, but um, I do feel compelled to play the devil's advocate for just a moment because um, if you play devil's advocate, I mean, who's to say that a student who performs well at a less famous medical school is more deserving of an opportunity in residency than a student who was an average student at a more famous school? If you want to play devil's advocate, I mean, the average student at a famous medical school, they probably had a much shinier CV when they applied. I mean, that's how they got into a top 10 school, right? And uh, I mean, if, if the best student at a lower tier school is so great, well, why didn't they have a higher science GPA or do better on the MCAT? And maybe the worst student at a top school is still better than the best student at a, at a not so good school. Uh, I mean, would you be surprised if you learned that the, uh, the third chair clarinet and the New York Philharmonic was a better musician than the soloist down at your community center? Would you be surprised that the no-name guy sitting at the end of some NBA team's bench, if he suited up for a college team, he could drop 40 points on them? Would you be surprised by that? Um, and please understand, I'm not trying to be an elitist here. I, I actually do believe that in the current era, there's, there's as much variation in capability or potential within a medical school class as there is across different medical schools. Um, and I also realize, I mean, let me be clear about this too. I also realize there's a credible argument that you can make that we should prioritize recent over remote performance, or that we should value performance in tasks that are more relevant to what you're being hired for than tasks or performance in less relevant tasks. But the point that I'm trying to make clear is that there's an assumption being made that a certain type of performance signifies someone who is more deserving of an opportunity. And, and that assumption requires a value judgment uh, that I wanted to make explicit. I'll come back to that point in a moment, but um, first I wanna make some other points about the paper. Uh, because the authors go on to say, the trend toward less transparency of medical student performance has wide implications. Obfuscation of grades and class ranking hurts high achieving students and it hurts program directors. A medical school's goal for its students should not simply be to get the best residency program, but the best match. It should be in everyone's best interest to provide comprehensive, transparent evaluations to optimize the chances of good matches. And when I first read this, it resonated with me. Um, I think because that idea of the best match, I like that. I want that to be true. But when I stepped back and thought about it, I was left with a big question. I mean, who gets to decide what match is the best match? I mean, we could probably all agree it shouldn't be just prestige-based. It shouldn't just be that U.S. News & World Report gets to decide what's the best match for everybody. So, I mean, maybe the deans shouldn't be so upset if they see non-prestigious programs on their match list. Uh, maybe they should just step back and say, well, you know, maybe that's not the specialty that this applicant really wanted, or maybe it's not the program that they desperately wanted to attend, but this is the best match for them. I let that hang in the air for just a second because I hope when you heard it, it struck you as being a little paternalistic. Aren't applicants in the best position to decide what's in their best interest? And if you agree that they are, well, then maybe, just maybe, 
the system we've got is actually the optimal system because it maximizes the number of students who have a chance at getting into a competitive specialty or a prestigious program. You get most of the students from the prestigious schools and a certain number from the non-prestigious schools that all are in the running. So perhaps that gives the most students the, um, the, the chance to pursue their dreams. And after all, they're in the best position to know what's in their best interest. Ultimately, I think if you don't like this system, I think there's a better argument to make. Instead of saying that it hurts a certain type of applicant or that um, we, could, we could have a system that led to the best matches, I think the best argument in favor of having more standardized information in the MSPE is that not doing so is unfair to programs. Why should programs only get full access to information about their applicants if they come from certain schools? Why shouldn't they get all the information? And then they can decide for their own selves how to weigh performance in one area versus another. And that brings me to the point that I really wanted to make in this video, which is this. If you do want to change this system, if you do want to have more meaningful data communicated in the MESPE, you need to realize that the AMC is not going to do it for you. They might make some recommendations, but um, at the end of the day, the schools are free to follow them or not. And you've got to realize that the schools aren't going to fix this problem either. Um, if nothing else, thinking about this paper should make it clear what the school's incentives are. Like I said, this is just a matter of strategy, and they're going to choose the strategy that's in their best interest and in the best interest of the greatest number of their students over the long run. And that strategy depends on where they perceive themselves to be situated in the grand ecosystem of residency selection. If you want the MSPE to be different than what it is now, then the hero you need is the program director because only the program directors have the power to change the incentives for schools. You don't understand what I'm getting at? Well, I want you to imagine this. Suppose that you have a, a dermatology or an orthopedic surgery residency program, and you get, let's say, 400 applications for four spots. And um, you decide to take a stand, and so you make it clear to your applicants. You say, look, we believe as a matter of principle that having certain data in the MSPE is important. And if your school doesn't include that information, well, we're going to put your application in the back of the pile. That's not to say I'm going to rule you out, but um, we're going to look at everybody else's application first, and we'll get to you when we get to you. What do you think would happen next? Especially if you convince a few other program directors to go along with you. How long is it going to take to have indignant students blowing up the dean's email and phone saying, why is the school screwing me over? Why are we not including this information that I need to be considered at this specialty of my choice or at my dream program? You need to remember that the system that we have, whether that's the MSPE or anything else, that system is a result of the incentives in play. So if you want to change the system, you have to change the incentives. So if you're a program director and you want to see quartile or class rank, well, that's how you do it. You have the power. But truthfully, I hope that you'll use your power to leverage an even better change than just that. Because, you know, I mean, including class rank tells you something, but it probably doesn't tell you what you really want to know. And you should be aware that, that getting that something, squeezing that information out of the schools, what's well, going to come at the cost of creating a more toxic learning environment where students know that they're constantly in competition with each other, every quiz, every test, every day on rounds. In reality, what you want are meaningful measures of students' competencies so that you can pick up their instruction where their old teachers left off. And you want that information to be delivered to you in a standardized, honest, and reliable way. And there's lots of ways that could be done, which I won't get into in this video. My point is simply that you have the power to get it done, however it is that you want it to be done. And with that, I come to the end of the inaugural Sheriff of Sodium Journal Club. And as a final thought for any program directors who might have listened through this video um, about the Dean's Letter, I thought it might be fitting to end with a quote from that most famous Dean, Dean Wormer from Animal House. And the quote is, the time has come for someone to put his foot down, and that foot is me. Thanks for listening.